So I am, my name is um, Diane Dwyer, and I actually am a teacher at the Haas Business School. I'm a part of the professional faculty there, and I teach media consulting to undergraduates at the business school. Um, and I also am an anchor at NBC. So I don't know if you guys have ever watched the local news, but when you started, I started at KTVU, Channel 2, 20 years ago. So when you guys were born, I started, and now I'm over at NBC and I anchor the weekend news at NBC. So you say to yourself, why would a news anchor be teaching a class about biology? And I have no idea. So, um, so there you go. Uh, I am supposed to, Professor Holsenbeck asked me to talk to you guys about the future of news. Seems odd to me too, but I'm going with it. Um, so how many of you re read a newspaper, and don't be embarrassed, actually touched, picked up a piece of newspaper in the last week and read a newspaper, actually touched one. That's actually a fair amount of people. Now, how many have read news but read it online instead of reading it by touching? So a majority of the folks read it that way, right? So I would argue, and I teach this in my class at Haas also, that the, um, that the news business is in the middle of an evolution also. So this is where I'm going to connect the dots a little bit. So where, if you were to look at the news business and you think about newspapers and the whole process of how you, know, you go, you cut down a tree, you drive it to a paper processing plant, you make paper out of it, and then you go print stuff on it, and then you take it and then you drive from house to house and you hand out these pieces of paper. That seems relatively archaic, right? Sort of as if we're in the ape phase of evolution, right? And we're down here and we're starting to stand up, but we're not quite there yet. So, um, if it, so where would you say natural selection, if, if if the newspaper business is in the middle of natural selection right now, I would argue perhaps maybe the paper part of it is a trait that we're going to lose, right? That that's part of this evolution that we're going through right now. Um, and where would you say, where would you describe an evolution, biological evolution, where the newspaper, where the newspaper business in particular is right now? Would you, would you put a are, are we still on four feet, or have we moved up, but we're not quite standing like humans yet? I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on it? It's kind of a weird concept. I'm with you. So um, given that I would say we're in sort of gorilla phase, we're kind of hairy, but losing some hair, and starting to stand up a little bit and getting a little straighter, and that brings me to another guest speaker we have today because we're, we're mixing it up a little bit. So um, I'd like to, you to introduce to you the next guest speaker, which is Professor Uchenbeck. Professor, are you there? Ah, it's Professor Uchenbeck. I want a banana. <laughs> oh, I do get a bit of, thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Uchenbeck. I'm not sure if Professor Uchenbeck speaks, but we'll find out. Oh, bruised bananas. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Professor Uchenbeck, would you like a microphone? Okay. So I don't, I, I don't know where to connect this whole thing in here. Hold on. Okay. Does this go under here? You could try. Can you people hear? <laughs> <laughs> I could just hold it, I suppose. Okay. Well, I'm Professor Uchenbeck. <laughs> Occasionally, Professor Holsenbeck lets me out of my lets me out of my office, and I come uh, lecture. 
Don't forget it. So today I'm going to talk about human evolution. Uh-oh. Uh, huh. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Sure? Yeah, yeah, I've I'm got happy it. To Th these Macintosh computers are very easy to use. I'm fine. Okay. It's so easy a gorilla can use them. Continuing your evolution. Okay. So I'm, Professor Holsenbeck uh, asked me to talk about human evolution, but he wanted me to give it a unique take. So I'm going to talk about human evolution from the perspective of a non-human primate. That would be, that'd be me. So there is actually some serious stuff I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. Um, right, technology. So this is what I'm going to be speaking to you about today. So first of all, humans have this conceit that they're quite different from the rest of uh, the animal kingdom. I'm going to dispel that. So I'm going to point out where in the tree of life you guys fit. I'm going to point out that from uh, the perspective of us normal apes, you guys are quite strange. I'm going to review some of the highlights of your fossil record, and I'm going to talk about some hypotheses for the origin of modern humans, okay? So you've probably seen this. This isn't a phylogeny. This is a picture, uh, or a painting, rather, of the universe pointing out that our, our solar system is somewhere over here. What I want to do is the same thing, but for phylogeny. So here is a phylogeny that includes all of life. So here we have bacteria, we have red algae, plants, a, a fly, uh, some things that live under docks in the bay, and then you are here. You're a vertebrate. And this is just pointing out some of the synapomorphies. Dr. Holsenbeck talked to you about synapomorphies to unite the different groups at each level. So all life shares a genetic code, for instance, this, the same genetic code. This is where eukaryotes evolve. There's specific types of flagellum that all the organisms above this point in the tree share. There's a specific stage of development that all uh, these organisms go through. And then vertebrates in these uh, things that live under docks in the, in, in the bay uh, have pharyngeal gill slits and a notochord. The, it's sort of a primitive type of backbone. Ah, that's neat. <coughs> wow. So this is just blowing up the vertebrate tree of life. So this part of the tree, all these organisms above this point in the tree have vertebrae. You have a vertebra, obviously, and you have jaws. Uh, fish in these organisms, the lungfish, the frog, and what we're going to call amniotes, all have ossified bones. At this point, you get muscularized fins with the beginnings of the pattern of bones you see in the arms and legs, one, two, followed by many. And then here at tetrapods, you have four limbs. And finally, just sort of really focus in on the amniote part of the tree. The amniotes, things like turtles, lizards, snakes, birds, crocodiles, and all mammals have an amniotic lining around the developing embryo. Uh, here at, di at, at uh, mammals, we all share hair, see? Um, and a specific jaw joint. And up here, uh, sharing with kangaroos in what we call a, a placental or eutherian mammals, they give birth to live young. That's viviparity. And just to sort of blow up the part of the tree, finally, this is where you are. We're, you and I are both primates. We have uh, fingernails, okay? Not, not claws, but fingernails. Now, for a while, we'll, we'll talk more about the phylogeny of apes, but you, and you are apes, whether you like it or not. Like other primates, uh, like other apes, you don't have a tail, a more erect posture, uh, relatively larger brains than other primates have, uh, you know, and some other characteristics such as uh, greater flexibility in the hips and the ankles. And basically every single gene that's been analyzed in a phylogenetic uh, way uh, point to humans being nested well within apes. Okay, there hasn't been a gene that's been found that says otherwise. So you are apes. So here's the phylogeny of apes. There's humans. There's the chimps. These are gorgeous creatures right here, gorillas, <laughs> orangutans, and gibbons. These are all the apes. And you note that humans, the closest relative of humans, are the chimpanzees. Even though humans, as I'll talk about, are strange apes, that is to say, you guys have many characteristics that are unique to yourselves, um, your closest relatives are the chimpanzees. In fact, if you were a chimpanzee and you asked a chimpanzee who its closest relative is, he would say, uh, humans, okay? And from my perspective, over here as a gorilla, I'm equally related to both the chimpanzees and the humans. So it's a misconception that I'm more closely related to chimps because we share, well, we're both hairy, so to speak. Um, but uh, so it's a misconception that just because 
we share a lot of characteristics. Gorillas and chimpanzees share a lot of characteristics that we're more closely related. That's not the case. Relatedness is all about the recency of common ancestry, remember. And humans and chimps share a common ancestor at this point, and gorillas are equally related to chimps and humans because we share a common ancestor with you guys right here. Okay. Now, the molecular evidence also points to a specific time at which you guys diverged from the chimpanzees. So this is a tree laid on its side, and you notice that the, the units at these branching points, the speciation events leading to the different groups now is in terms of millions of years. And humans and chimps share a common ancestor that's roughly five, six, seven million years ago. Okay. And that, that ancestry, again, is more recent than the one that, that you guys share with us. So the humans, chimps, and gorillas share a common ancestry perhaps eight million years ago. And there's lots of characteristics that have evolved uniquely along the human line over the, that five or six million year period, during which you, you have a lineage leading to modern humans. So for instance, one characteristic that you guys have, which is unique, is you have 23 pairs of chromosomes instead of 24 like the chimpanzees and the gorillas, me, have. And this is your second chromosome, and what you see here is the chromosome has been colored by basically the gene content. Gene content um, and the order in which genes occur along a chromosome is largely conserved, okay? I mean, that's that, something that evolves, of course, but it evolves relatively slowly. And so you can see that these two, these are two different chromosomes in the chimpanzee and also in the gorilla. You can see that during the human evolution, chromosome two was, fused by, uh, was uh, formed by a fusion of two different chromosomes from the chimp uh, or the gorilla. So you can see that the gene content matches up. You can see that band matches there, that band matches there, these band ma match up here. So there was a fusion right about that point. The ends of the chromosomes are called the telomeres, basically the telomeres of the chromosomes. And nowadays we actually have fully sequenced the human, chimpanzee, and gorilla ch genomes. That is to say, we know all three billion or so nucleotides, A, C, Gs, and Ts in the genome. The only column I really want you to look at is the very top one, okay? This is just a measure of how similar the genomes are uh, between chimp and human, ch gorilla and human, and chimp and gorilla. Notice that the chimp-human split, as you, the, the, the similarity in the, in, the in the DNA sequences, they're most similar here. They only differ basically one in 100 positions. So you take two stretches of, of, of DNA, match them up in the human and the chimp, and they admit the mismatch is about one in 100, so very similar. And the mismatch is a little bit greater if you compare gorillas and humans or chimps and gorillas, as you'd expect, because they're more that's a more distant uh, relationship. Okay, how am I doing on time? All right. So I want to point out now, so that's just a little bit in terms of just getting you placed in the tree of life. You're apes, okay? And your closest relatives are the chimps. And you diverged from the chimps about five, six million years ago, somewhere about then. So a little bit about you guys, I mean, you are a little strange, okay? <laughs> you're, you're, you're unique among apes. Uh, you're bipedal, that is to say, you habitually walk on, on your hind limbs. Now, I, I know you're seeing a gorilla walking on his hind limbs, but that's, that's very atypical for gorillas. Um, you have uh, much larger brains than, than the other uh, apes, much less hairy, obviously. Less sexual dimorphism between the males and females and you have a, a lot more technology than uh, the other primates or the other apes have. So this is just sort of taking different great apes, a orangutan, a chimp, a gorilla, once again, handsome devil, and humans. And you can see that, for instance, your legs are much longer in proportion to your, your total height. That's one thing that humans are unique, unique about. Um, your arms are relatively shorter as well. You have larger brains, and you know, the other, these other apes have uniformly uh, covered with hair. You're much more sparsely covered in hair except in your, your head and your armpits and in another place. Okay, so this is the tree again to remind you, this part of the tree, the part that's leading to humids, all the organisms that, that occur from the point of the split between chimpanzees and humans up to modern humans, those are called hominids. And the question is, what happened along this part of the lineage? Is there any document, like fossils for instance, that can tell us what the creatures that lived along this part of the, the tree looked like? Now, if you're a chimpanzee, of course, you wouldn't be really interested in this part of the tree, you'd be interested in this part of the tree, but chimpanzee paleontologists are very unlucky because there's only one single fossil along this entire part of the tree leading to the chimpanzees, and it's just part of, a, part of this bone right here. That's all they have. 
On the other hand, humans have a very rich fossil record, so this part of the tree is incredibly well documented. What's going on here? All oh, right, so, so just to review what the paleontological record looks like, now I'm going to start to talk about the fossil record. From about 8 to 15 million years ago, no hominids, but lots and lots of apes. Many more ape species alive 8 to 15 million years ago than there are now, which is we're pretty depauperate in species diversity of apes today. About 6 million years ago, like I said, you have the last common ancestor of the chimpanzee and uh, humans. And we'll talk about this particular fossil find from a year ago called Artipithecus. The Artipithecus clade, hominid clade is established. About 4.3 million years ago, you have adaptation to heavily masticated diets. We can tell that because the fossils that we find have huge molars and lots of attachments for muscles uh, for the jaws. And you see the establishment of the Australopithecus clade. About 2.7 million years ago, you start to see uh, fossils that have much larger brains. They're, they're called Homo. That's the genus that they're given to. And you see evidence of tool use and stone tools and we also have evidence of large mammal butchery. You can tell that because the bones have scratch marks where meat was cut off of them. About 1.8 million years ago, we'll talk about two expansions from Africa. All this, occurred, all this evolution occurred in Africa. You have the first expansion up from Africa of the hominid lineage. Around 600,000 years ago, you have the, the Neanderthal clade established. And then about 160, 200,000 years ago, you have modern humans appear. And about 30,000 years ago, Neanderthals go extinct. And after that, uh, all hell breaks loose. So uh, Darwin visited the Galapagos and so forth. So let's go review some of these fossils. So first of all, like I said, the fossil record is incredibly rich for, um, or very rich for the hominid lineage. And this is just sort of summarizing what's known about the hominid, hominid lineage. Now, one of the problems with this field, this is called the field of paleoanthropology. These are scientists who study the hominid fossils, is that there tends to be many more paleoanthropologists than there are bones to study. So there's this tendency to o name things, oversplit them, basically. So every fossil has a tendency to get a new name. But this, this is probably a conservative guesstimate to how many different species were alive. And the main point to take away from this is that at different times, there were multiple hominids alive at the same time, co coexisting. So the, the tree of hominids is actually much more depauperate now. There's only one species than there was in the past where there are multiple species at the same time. The other thing is, um, I'm not going to expect you to remember all these names, but I just want you to get a feel for what the general trends in, in the evolutionary history are. And the main thing to look at is, when did bipedalism evolve and when did larger brains evolve? Did bi larger brains evolve before bipedalism or the other? There's other characteristics we could keep track of, but in terms of what I'm going to show you, keep track of those characteristics. All right, so the first find I want to talk about is Artipithecus. And it turns out UC Berkeley's had a large role in, in human evolution, understanding human evolution. So I'm going to, even though it looks like Cal comes up all the time, it's because Cal comes up all the time in, in, the, his, in the study of human evolutionary history. So what I'm going to do is talk about the discovery of Artipithecus. This is where Artipithecus was discovered in Ethiopia. This is an aerial photo of the, air, of, the, of the site. So what you see here is, um, we're going from south to north, and laid out along here is showing you that the rocks down here are older, and the rocks up here are younger. And so you, just by walking from south to north, you walk on rocks that are getting progressively younger. These are old, these are young, I'm sorry. Uh, and then over here, you can see where they found evidence of you know, actual bones, hominid bones, and where they found evidence of tool use. So you can see the tool use is much more recent than, uh, than the evidence for other hominids. Now, there's a team that was led by a scientist that's f on the fifth floor in this building named Tim White. And they've gone to this area of um, Ethiopia every year since the early 1990s. They have a large team of people that every year after the rains, they walk around looking for fossils, essentially. They don't dig. They look for evidence of fossils eroding out of, out of the earth. And then once they find them, then they start to dig. Now, now Dr. White didn't go to this region randomly. He went there because, A, he kno knew that humans evolved in Africa, so he went to Africa, not to Antarctica or North America. And he knew that the split between humans and chimpanzees was about five or six million years ago. So he looked for rocks that were about four or five million years old. So he went to the right place and looked for rocks at the right time. 
So these are the, the right place and the right time. There's Dr. White right here. Here's one of his collaborators, Owen Lovejoy. He, Dr. Lovejoy is at um, uh, Kent State University. And this is Burhani Aspa, one of the Ethiopian scientists involved in the expedition. He actually was, um, uh, got his PhD from UC Berkeley and was Dr. Holsenbeck's TA in uh, anthropology. He was a hard ass. <laughs> and uh, this is the paper that came out about a year ago, an entire issue of the journal Science, where they announced the discovery of Artipithecus, the oldest known and most complete hominid fossil found yet. So what does this skeleton look like? So here's some little bits and pieces of the skeleton. So on the right here, we have the hand of Artipithecus. And the important point to note is it has an opposable thumb. In the right, you have um, the foot of Artipithecus. And notice that it has this big toe called the halix that's what they call divergent. It's sticking out to the side. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, here in the center, you have the, the, the uh, teeth of Artipithecus. And the main point to note here is that um, that the canines, the, the large teeth here in the chimpanzee, the canines in Artipithecus are intermediate between what you see in modern humans and in the chimpanzee. And finally, this is the hip bone structure of Artipithecus. And um, note that it's basically, we'll be talking about this other fossil, uh, Lucy, in a bit, but notice that its hip structure is very similar to Lucy's. And you can tell a lot about how organisms walk by looking at their hip bones. Specifically, this bone here, called the ilium, is typically very long in organisms that uh, walk on their knuckles and much shallower, like in modern humans, for organisms that walk upright. So the, the, it already looks as if Artipithecus was up, walked upright just from the hip structure. Here, once again, is the uh, foot structure with sort of a re recreation of what, what Artipithecus's foot looked like. It's probably an all-purpose foot, so to speak. It's a per foot that worked well walking around on the ground. It's also one that you'd, you know, you'd have a grasping toe. It would have been quite handy for climbing trees. There's a nice picture of the skeleton. Now, it is the case that other primates, uh, other apes can walk. So this is a chimpanzee walking along the river, and notice he's walking upright. He's not doing it very well, but he's walking upright. And so all these, all these great apes can walk upright pretty, you know, occasionally. They just don't do it for a, long, for a long duration. The unique thing about humans is that you're really well adapted to walking upright for long, you know, all the time. In fact, you can't walk you know, like a chimpanzee with his, on his, with his knuckles very well at all. So, so here's some of the evidence that um, Dr. White sort of summarized for me uh, that, that Artipithecus walked bipedally. So first of all, the shape of the upper pelvis, like I mentioned. Um, the shape of the lateral foot, so the, what does this mean? It means that the second and third toes are propulsive. That is, they're the ones that actually give you, you know, forward motion when you walk. And the halix, the big foot, the big toe is divergent. So this is the one that actually would be good for grasping the trees and whatnot. So he calls this the all-terrain vehicle foot. And the, also the skull the, the, of, of Artipithecus has a shortened cranial base, which usually the hole that um, the, the, the nerve, the central nerve uh, goes into the head through in organisms that walk. Gosh, I So creatures that walk, oops. Ugh. So the hole basically goes into the back of the head and creatures that walk on all four limbs, whereas for creatures that, that walk upright, the, the hole called the foramen magnum is actually you know, on the cranial base, as they say. And so Artipithecus had this pattern, not that pattern, indicative that she that, that probably walked upright. Okay, so that's all I want to say about Artipithecus. What am I doing on time here? I think I'm doing okay. So I'll talk a little bit about Lucy. This is another uh, fossil find. This one's younger. So Artipithecus was about 4.4 4 million years ago. Lucy is much younger. This is a find that occurred in 1974 by Donald Johansson, uh, once again in Africa. And th it is an incredibly complete skeleton. So that looks incomplete. So if you look at this, say that's a complete skeleton. But you have to remember that we're bilaterally symmetrical. So if you only find one bone on this side, you know what it looks like on that side. It's symmetrically, it's symmetrical to that one, right? So really, you can actually piece together much more of the skeleton than you could ever imagine just by looking at this. Looking at this. And there's a beautiful picture of Lucy uh, from two million years ago, three million years ago. Here's a reconstruction of the skull. And this is a reconstruction of the hip. So once again, over here on the right, 
you have, um, okay, there we go. On the right, you have modern humans. On the left, the chimpanzee. In the middle, you have um, Lucy. And notice that the femur comes in at an angle. This is basically to get your center of gravity. Pe the individuals that walk habitually upright, like humans, they get their center of gravity as close to the center of their body as they can, so the femurs come in at an angle. Whereas in chimpanzees, that's not the case. It's just a straight line. And you can tell that this is the case, that, that Lucy had the similar type of pattern because of the angle of the knee. So you can see, this is humans. You can see that the, the knee uh, has a, it's flat here. It's going to be um, joined cleanly here, but you can see the femur goes off at an angle. Chimpanzees, it's straight up and down, but in the Lucy uh, knee, the, they call Don Johansson's knee, but Lucy's knee, uh, you have this, this angle again, indicating that Lucy almost certainly walked upright. And not only that, we have tracks. So these are tracks along a lava bed. So this is, these, aren't, these are trace fossils. They're still fossils, but they're trace fossils uh, from 3.6 million years ago of hominids that were clearly walking upright. You don't see any indication that, they, they, that their hands are dragging along or anything. Okay, I think I'll skip that. So the last bit I want to talk about for the fossil record is just the genus Homo. And I'm not going to go into any detail about any skeleton. I just want to give you a flavor for what's going on. Some of the major traits that evolve in Homo are a larger brain. Okay, so this is where you see the emergence of a longer, larger brain. So the first thing you should note is that bipedalism evolved before large brains did. Um, the smaller and flatter face, you have much smaller uh, teeth and jaws, a greater height, and some other characteristics, less sexual dimor dimorphism as well. But these are all characteristics that evolve in the skeletons in the, that I'm going to show you in a bit. So here's one of the older ones, Homo ergaster, that lived about one and a half million years ago. Homo habilis, about two million years ago. Homo rudolfensis, also about two million years ago. Notice there's a great diversity of, of Homo in the, back in, the, in the fossil record, it's living at about the same time. Here's a very, very complete skeleton of Homo erectus. Now, Homo erectus is the last, a very long-lived species from about 1.7 to a quarter million years ago. And, um, and this is the last species before you have the emergence of modern humans. So about a quarter million years ago, you have Homo erectus dying out and you have modern humans originating. And there's a number of models that are out there for how modern humans originated. One of the models I'll discuss is the multi-regional hypothesis and the other is the, is the so-called out of Africa hypothesis. So what do these hypotheses look like? So the multi-regional model says that so I should say the Homo erectus is the first hominid to actually spread across the world. So the multi-regional hypothesis says that down here you have Homo erectus, and you have these arrows mean you have migration between these different populations. So you have gene flow occurring between these different areas, and this gene flow is continuous, and you have Homo sapiens evolving simultaneously, that is to say, emerging simultaneously over a wide geographic area. That's the multi-regional hypothesis. The out of Africa hypothesis is different. It says that modern humans, you have Homo erectus down here, Homo erect, modern humans evolved from Homo erectus and then spread out through the world. Okay, so that's a different model. It's, it's they evolved in one place and then later spread out across the world. So which of these two models best explains the observations we have out there? Well, there's a very famous uh, evolutionary biologist by the name of Alan Wilson. He was at UC Berkeley for about 35 years. He died in 1991 of leukemia. And he's published a very famous paper called, uh, by Vigilant et al. on the origins of modern humans. And what he, what he and his, his colleagues did is they sequenced the mitochondrial DNA sequences from about a, over 100 uh, humans, where they knew the geographic origin of these different people. So remember, the mitochondrial DNA is the circular bit of DNA that occurs in the mitochondrion. And one thing that Dr. Holzenbeck didn't mention is that the mitochondrion is, is maternally inherited. So all the mitochondrion, the males in the audience, they're dead ends. It's only the, the mitochondria and the females that have a hope to go on into the next generation. So they're maternally inherited. So when you trace a tree of mitochondrial DNA, you're tracing a maternal history. Okay. So what he did is made a phylogenetic tree of modern humans. And uh, there it is. On the, on the, so you can see, uh, well I can barely see out of this thing now. So there's the, modern, the tree of modern humans. And the point here is that the root of the, mo of the modern humans, this is the, the most common recent ancestor of the mitochondrial DNA for all modern humans. The question is, where did that originate? And by this tree, you can infer that it was in Africa because all the lineages that first branch off, all the mitochondrial lineages that branch off first, 
are um, from people with origins in Africa. So this gives rise to the idea that the, the out of Africa hypothesis is the correct one, and they call this common ancestor of, of, the, um, of the mitochondria, they call this the mitochondrial Eve. It was sort of an unfortunate, cute name, but in a sense, there was some woman that all this mitochondrial DNA did trace to. And so if you want to call her Eve, that's your business. But you have to realize that she wasn't the only individual in the population at the time. She just happened to be the only individual in the population that happened to have uh, mitochondrial DNA that gave rise to all the modern humans. All the other DNA was, uh, mitochondrial DNA was a dead end. Okay, where are we now? I'm going to skip this part, although it's fascinating. And the last thing I want to talk about is Neanderthals. I talked about Neanderthals briefly, that they were established about 600,000 years ago, they're clay. They're anatomically very modern. They have brains as big as modern human brains, or bigger. Okay, they live, this is a geographic distribution of, of Neanderthals. Notice that the European and also in the Middle East. But you should realize that at the same time, mo anatomically modern humans, homo sapiens like us, were living in the same region. And so people have always speculated we speculated about whether or not there could have been love between Neanderthals and modern humans, okay? And of course, um, of course, scientists don't call it uh, that, they call it gene flow. <coughs> so this is a study that came out literally uh, five months ago, and it was uh, led by this Svante Pebo who was just visiting Berkeley uh, two days ago. And then UC Berkeley uh, faculty involved were Rasmus Nielsen, who's up on the fourth floor, and Monty Slacken, who's up also up on the fourth floor. These were the theoretical biologists who analyzed their, the data that Svante Pebo's group uh, generated, and I should note that what they did is they sequenced Neanderthal genome. All right, so how do you do that? Because there are no Neanderthals around today. Oh, I should also point out that th there are a lot of UC Berkeley faculty and, and students involved in this, so all the blue uh, bits here are people that were involved in it that were from UC Berkeley. This is the paper that was published. So what they did is they actually took a Neanderthal bone and they ground out some of the interior part of, a, of a, a three different bones from females, okay? And then they, using modern techniques, they sequenced the genome. I'm not gonna describe them, but basically how methods uh, sequence DNA today, uh, or genomes today, is they don't literally go from one end of the genome and read sequence, you know, sequence by sequence all the way to the end. What they do is they divide or blast the genome into lots of little fragments and they sequence these little fragments individually and then they piece together using computers all the fragments. It's like a big puzzle, okay? And it turns out the DNA in these bones is already fragmented anyways because it's 30,000-year-old uh, DNA, so it's already fragmented just because of what happens to DNA after death. So it's fine. It, 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 the, the DNA was, is, was, could easily be sequenced using modern techniques, although so there were some issues with contamination and whatnot. So what they did w in terms of analyzing the data was trying to distinguish between several different models. So here's Homo erectus. We know that it was the ancestor of all the modern humans. Neanderthals diverged about 600,000 years ago. And here's the modern human tree. So this, is the, this would be the out of Africa hypothesis. These populations here are African populations and these are not African populations. And the question is, did you have gene flow between Homo erectus and Neanderthals? Or did you have gene flow that occurred uh, basically this would have had it been in the Middle East uh, as modern humans were spreading out through the rest of the world, or was it specific to some populations? And, and analysis of the, of the genome DNA firmly supports the idea that you had um, gene flow or, uh, between Neanderthal populations and modern human populations at the base of the part of the tree that goes to the other parts of the world. Okay? The way you can tell this is that non-African populations and Neanderthals share unique uh, DNA nucleotides that, that you don't find in Africans. So this is the evidence that supports this hypothesis. So it looks like there was gene flow. About one to four percent of non-African humans, individuals, uh, their DNA is from Neanderthals is the best estimate. So looking out in the audience, about one to four percent of your DNA is from Neanderthals. All right, so I want to just give a few final thoughts before I stop this lecture. And this is not gonna be covered in exams, so you don't have to worry about this. So the first point I wanna make, because I know a lot of the students in this, in this, in this class are pre-med, is you can choose any major and still be a candidate for medical school. I think this is something that's not well understood. Being pre-med is taking certain classes, okay? It's not a certain major. And so this is all information almost taken verbatim from Nancy Finkel, who's one of the um, uh, advisors here on, on campus about uh, taking courses. 
And she says, these are the courses you need to take to be a pre-med. And it also helps to have research experience, you know, have some community service, being able to teach a, a speak a foreign language is a, is a real benefit as well. And I want to talk about specifically um, research experience. As you probably guessed by now, the faculty at UC Berkeley aren't selected based on how well they give lectures, okay? <laughs> They're selected based on their research, and this is something, generally speaking, the, the people here at UC Berkeley do quite well. And so you're at this university where you're not being taken care of very well, like you would be if you were at a, a large private school like Harvard or something. You're, the only thing you have going for you in terms of this university is you have access to good research op opportunities. So you could actually get into labs and do research. And so what I'm gonna do is talk about how you might go about doing that. Now there are some programs on campus, one is called the URAP program, that takes interested undergraduates and pipes them into uh, various labs on campus. But there's other ways of doing this as well. And the basic idea is try to, tr try to make contact with a professor that, that does work that you're interested in. So the first thing you would do is you would knock on the professor's door, right? So knock, knock. I'm, I'm going to be talking to this professor about potential work in his or her lab. You greet the professor, say hello. Uh, I'm Uchenbeck, Harry Uchenbeck, who are you? You talk to, you know, hopefully you will have actually done a little bit of work beforehand and you can discuss the research and why you're interested in coming into that lab. So here I am talking to Professor Doris Backtrog, who's up on the fourth floor of this building. And of course, be prepared for a long talk. Professors like to talk. So here I'm still talking to her. But she was very, very nice and said, sure, we've got some opportunities for you in the lab. And she took me in the lab. I met the nice people in the lab. Here I am shake, shaking hands with one of the nice people. And I had a great time. Here I am working in the lab. So I've got a pipette right there, um, doing real science. Um, I don't know what she expected. I am a gorilla and I'm in a lab. What do you expect? But I had some issues and so I was kicked out, but I don't see, think you would have the same problems. So take advantage of your time at UC Berkeley. I, and one of the ways you can do that is to get some research experiment, uh, experience. rather. Go Bears. And thanks, uh, Professor Dwyer. <laughs> ah.